developing sustainable biomaterials for 3D printing. Um, as you can tell, I'm on my own. Leah couldn't make it this weekend, but I am incredibly honored to be mentored by her, uh, and I'm excited to tell you more about this project. So to start off, we ask the question, what are sustainable biomaterials? So there's been a lot of talk about open source hardware over the past you know, few hours, but I want you all to think about what an open source material would look like. And specifically, a material that is bio-based, meaning that is, it is derived from or produced by renewable biological matter. So you can think of plants, animals, bacteria, fungi, et cetera. And not only is it bio-based, but it should also be biodegradable. So it should degrade naturally into the soil, into a carbon-based biomass carbon dioxide, water, and it shouldn't release any toxins into the soil that could harm it. We are also specifically looking at biomaterials that will degrade naturally into our backyard. So nothing that will require a like industrial composting machine. We want to just like throw these things outside on a hike and they'll totally disintegrate into the environment. So this is a graph that is often used to kind of distinguish and describe all these materials. So you can see in this bottom corner here, we have all of our plastics and metals. Most of what our hardware is made of falls into this corner of non-bio-based and non-biodegradable. And then we're looking at that top corner of the materials that are biodegradable and bio-based. So we can think of very traditional materials like cotton or wool, but we can also think of newer materials that are more engineered, like PLA. I also want to focus on one even sub-sub category of these materials, which are biomaterials that are derived from bio-wastes. So, one example of these bio-waste based materials is called Reclaim. This is a project that I focused on during my PhD. I brought lots of material samples today that I'm going to start passing around. Try not to break them, but I won't be disappointed if you do. I would also like them back at the end of this talk, so find me afterwards. So I'm going to start by passing around a sample of Reclaim. This is a biomaterial made from my composted food waste. So as you can see, here's an insight into my tumbler composter that was in Boulder. And this material is inherently circular. So it is made from my waste that is composted, turns into this really beautiful, lovely hummus, which is a soil-like material. And then we add other bio-based binding ingredients to turn it into a clay, which we then sculpted. And then once we have this reclaim artifact, we can throw it back into our composter where it turns back into compost, or we can throw it out in our backyard. And then because it's made of compost, it adds lots of nutrients and helps the plants grow. And now we have plants for more food and we start the cycle again. However, because of this circular making and unmaking process, we get a different batch of reclaim every time we make it that reflects what I've been eating. So, <laughs> for example, if I have been on a deadline and I am drinking a bunch of coffee you will see coffee grounds in the compost. It will reflect in the texture, in the color, in the smell, and this is a smelly material. Um, <laughs> and so because it's ever-changing, we use a very hands-on manual workflow. So a lot of sculpting, hands-on molding, um, and this allows us to accommodate all those changing material properties. It's also very intimate, and I loved how I got to really engage with my food waste. But now that I am a postdoc, 
I am working on transitioning into a digital workflow. So specifically using clay 3D printing to fabricate these materials. So here you can see the extrusion with this little clay 3D printer. And we care about using a digital workflow because 3D printing allows for forms, textures, and computational meaning that we can't achieve by hand. And that's really interesting, and it expands our creative possibilities. So then the question becomes, how do we develop a printable biomaterial? So here you can see our 3D printer. This is an Ezao. It's probably the lowest cost 3D printer for clay on the market right now. It fits on your desktop. It's easily hackable. I am a huge, huge fan of the Ezao. And so it really becomes a problem of designing a biomaterial that works with this printer. So we come up with several considerations for biomaterial development. The first is we actually need a cohesive, uniform paste that we can print. Next, it needs to be the right hardness. So we can't have a material that's too soft because then it just becomes a puddle of noodles on our print bed. Or it's too hard and we can't actually extrude it. Next, it has to be the right elasticity, or in this case, inelasticity, meaning that when the plunger is trying to extrude it, it actually pushes through the printer and it's, the material isn't pushing back. It needs to have the right stability. So once it leaves the printer, it is a stable paste on the print bed. It's not jiggly, jelloey, falling over on itself. We can actually build up layers successfully. It also needs to maintain strength once it is dried. So for example, it can't shrink dramatically and cause a bunch of cracks. It needs to be a strong, stable print. And it needs to be somewhat accurate. Whatever model we input, we actually want to see that model. So it can't shrink and deform in a non-uniform way. So for the first three, we can really think about these more broadly as solving for extrudability of a material, and then also looking for a material that has the right print quality. So most of these are addressed through material development. But material development is also dependent on our hardware. So for example, this is a custom printer that we made. And this little, uh, this heater, I mean, this little heater fits up against our extrusion noddle, nozzle. We have these magnets that let it sit right next to our material and it dries it as it's being printed. And this allows for uh, drying as it's printed, which increases the print quality. It increases stability and strength and uniform drying, which is really, really crucial. It also means we also develop new software to support all of these uh, considerations. So this is some really amazing open source hardware that our lab has developed. Um, it's called Weave Slicer. You can download it from our GitHub. And Weave Slicer allows us to print these forms that have very, very dramatic overhangs. Anyone who's worked with clay, you know it is wet and heavy, and if we try to print a bowl, it will immediately collapse on itself. So this allows for more dramatic overhangs, which improves the stability of our print and eventually model accuracy, which is also important. Another piece of uh, software that we're currently working on is called Travel Slicer. This allows us to print, um, it reduces the number of travel paths in different branched uh, models. So we can get much cleaner, more accurate prints rather than having that mess of support material caused by travel paths. And so then that brings us back to the material development part, which is um, where I kind of hit my stride as a material scientist. And so we want to develop a material that has the right extrudability and print quality. 
So to explain this, I'm going to use this new material that I've been working on, uh, which is still kind of a work in progress, um, to explain how I actually develop a material that can be printed. So this material that I'm going to start handing around, this is derived from eggshells. We get our eggshells from two places, the first being restaurant waste. This is uh, eggshells from our local diner in Albuquerque. It's called Frontier. It is an Albuquerque institution. <laughs> it is located directly across from campus. It's been there since the 70s, and it is amazing. Um, however, when we get their compost, it is nasty. <laughs> So we go through a very intense cleaning process to collect all of our eggs. We also use personal waste. Um, some of Leah's family in New Mexico owns chickens, so we collect uh, eggshells from the local chickens, as well as our own personal eggshell waste from local grocery stores. So once we have our eggshells, we grind them up into this powder that you can see up here. It's super, super fine. And then we uh, combine it with these other ingredients to get that cohesive paste. So we add xanthan gum, which is essentially a fermented sugar, and this helps with that inelasticity, so it makes it actually be able to extrude. We also add methyl cellulose, which improves print quality and strength. And then we add water to get it into a paste-like, clay-like material. Once we've identified these ingredients, it then becomes a problem of finding the right recipe. So here's just kind of five key iterations that we went through, uh, starting on the left here. Um, that was one of our, our first tries. Our final material is on the other side, and we have some other iterations in the middle. And it really becomes a problem of solving for something that has the right hardness, so it can't be too hard because we couldn't even print one of our samples. It can't be too soft because it just turns into a pile. And if we get something that extrudes, we want a really nice quality. We don't want it falling over on itself, and you know we want it to resemble our model nicely. So once we identified our recipe, we printed a bunch of stuff. But for the sake of time, I'm only going to talk about two of our prints. These are some data visualization vessels we do. These uh, vessels visualize the number of eggshells produced in the US. So on the left here, we have eggshells per month in the year of 2023. So you can see how many egg eggs we're eating and throwing away. Meanwhile, on the right side, we have eggshells per year from 2000 to 2023. And you can see that we started eating a lot more eggs, which I think is because of the popularity of brunch, but that is not proven. <laughs> the other example artifact that I want to briefly talk about is what we call our protective birdhouse. As you can tell, it is not eggshell colored, and that is because we added chili powder. Chili powder is incredible because it has this chemical, capsaicin, which squirrels are allergic to. And squirrels are actually an invasive species to New Mexico. So our goal becomes to protect native birds in New Mexico by incorporating the capsaicin into the birdhouse. So we're keeping the birds safe, we're deterring squirrels, and you can also tell that this print has a slightly shiny texture. I'm gonna pass around another sample. That is because we coated this birdhouse in a layer of beeswax. Beeswax is bio-based, biodegradable, and it reduces water damage. So it makes it a totally waterproof birdhouse. So it's not going to turn into a pile of paste when, um, when it rains, which it doesn't rain often in New Mexico, but 
When it does, it's intense. <laughs> so after we printed all this stuff, we were really intrigued at looking at how they actually biodegrade. Where do they go when we dispose of all these artifacts? So we ran this biodegradability test where we had this printed tile, very similar to the tile coated in beeswax that's going around. And we put this tile in some native soil collected from my backyard. And we found that in just 25 days, this tile had essentially totally disintegrated and reincorporated itself into the soil. And it's really important because eggshells provide a lot of key nutrients to encourage the growth of new plants, which go to feed chickens and produce more eggs, which is really, really key. So we kind of look at that. We go back to this looking at the circular making and unmaking of this material. We can see our chickens and our eggs and our paste. And we also look at how we can recycle it and reuse it. So once we have a printed artifact or we have print waste, we can take all of that print that has been dried, we can crush it back up, and we can rehydrate it with water to turn it back into a printable paste and reuse that. So what are some next steps for this project? These are my last samples going around. These samples are new biomaterials that I'm working on. We have a material that is printed primarily out of cottonwood leaves. Cottonwoods are a native uh, tree in uh, New Mexico. And then we also have orange peels. I forced most of my lab to eat oranges throughout the winter and was collecting those. The lab smelled amazing. Um, but as you can see, these two recipes have shrunk dramatically. So these are all the same model that we've printed, but we have massive shrinkage and cracking. And that's because of the amount of cellulose in the leaves and orange peels. So our goal is to be able to iterate on these recipes to maintain that print accuracy. So now, just wrapping up my talk, I want to talk about why this is important and why should we care about all of these new materials at Open Hardware Summit. First of all, new materials, new hardware, new software, it expands our toolbox. And by expanding our toolbox, we can be more creative with what we make. It also highlights the entangled development process of materials, software, and hardware. New hardware can mean new materials. New materials can mean new software. All of them feed into each other, and it's really generative. It's also important for we, as people who like to make stuff, we need to grapple with our environmental impact, and materials is a really easy way to address that. And lastly, these materials, these biomaterials that are bio-based and biodegradable, really encourage us to shift our thinking towards these circular models of making and unmaking, ultimately encouraging us to think about the interconnections between us as humans, our non-human counterparts, our chickens, our eggs, our trees, our soil, and think about all of us as helping and supporting each other, which can lead to a more sustainable future. Thank you so much for listening. My name's Fiona. I'll let the samples keep circulating, but uh, find me afterwards. I would like them back eventually. Thank you.